Mm, but real question. Shabbat Shalom. It's June 27th. And we're studying Parsha Balak. This is going to be part three. Um, part one and two was very hectic. There was a lot of screaming and painting on tablecloths and wielding super glue and garden shears. So, mm, kind of sent the little kids off to take a time out. And I've got Kylie with me now. That's Kylie with me. Eating her lunch slash brunch. <laughs> but, um, so we're picking up from the blog www.safeguardingtheeternal.wordpress.com And again, if you press spacebar after you enter that in to your search bar, you should be able to type in there Balak, B-A-L-A-K, and the title of the entry that we're looking for is, um, It's God's Communication Continues, Parasha Balak, and We've caught it about halfway through. If you scroll down to, there's a picture of, um, a color picture of, looks like Moses near an altar. Why, what, no. Brain work. Balak and Balaam. They're by their uh. altar. <laughs> so say, it seemed no. weird that there was an altar outside of the Mishkan. So this is where we're at. We were at the mountaintop with Balak and Balaam, and this is the first utterance that's going to come out of, of Balaam's mouth. Now, we read this this week. They're very powerful. I was very intrigued by the things that come out of Balak's mouth, and some of the things we've covered are just basically that because Leora asked a good question, was God's angel standing in the way in order to um, protect God's people from Bilaam's curses, basically was the question. And I said, I think, more likely, because the curse of an evil person, it doesn't do anything to God's people. If God is saying, you can't curse them, they're blessed then what was the purpose of the angel standing in the way? And I think it was to teach us that God will <laughs> Sorry, paper started flying. God will um, do anything in his power to stop human beings from going in the wrong direction. Even if it's someone who's quote-unquote a bad person. So... Bill, um, he wanted to turn him around, and then it caused him to think about what he was doing and repent. He wants all people to come to repentance, so I think we're supposed to learn that lesson, because I don't think he was there to protect Israel. Israel already had God's protection, but that was a good question, I thought, that, uh, Leora had. So, um, let's just jump into the parasha, Bamid Bar 22, 37 through, um... 23 in verse 4. Balak said to Balaam, Did I not urgently send you to summon you? Why did you not go to me? Am I not capable of honoring you? Balaam said to Balak, Behold, now I have come to you. I am here now, right? That's my interpretation. Am I empowered to say anything? Whatever word God puts into my mouth, that shall I speak. And it was in the morning Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the heights of Baal, and from there he saw the edge of the people. Milam said to Balak, Balak <clears throat> Build for me seven altars and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. In the anniversary, stand by your burnt offering while I go. Perhaps Hashem will happen toward me and show me something that I can tell you. He went alone. God happened upon Bilam and he said to him, I prepared seven altars and brought up a bull and a ram on each altar. Thus far, God has only come to speak to Bilam at night. Now that they are in the light, it is only that he happens upon him. 
The Hebrew word kira means encountering accidental. It can be friendly or hostile. It can be either kind of an encounter. Um, there are two things to consider here. Balak and Balaam are evidently aware of the rights of animal offering among the children of Israel and has shown in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. They, like many, may have seen this as a way to gain favor in his eyes and score some points. The sacrificial system was never meant to buy God's love. It was always a way that the people could draw near to the Lord in a way that the culture would appreciate and understand, and foremost as a foreshadowing of the atoning work of Yeshua. These are things that Balak and Balaam are ignorant of. This practice is repeated by them several times throughout their scheme and is clearly futile. And then Micah 6 and 6 through 8, you ask, With what shall we approach Hashem? Humble myself before God on high. Shall I approach him with burnt offerings or with calves in their first year? Will Hashem be appeased by thousands of rams or with ten thousands of streams of oil? Shall I give over my firstborn to atone for my transgression or the fruit of my belly for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good? What does Hashem require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with with your God? And then we go on to the Midbar 23, from 5 through 14, back to the Parsha. Shem put an utterance in Balaam's mouth and said, Go back to Balak, and thus shall you say. He declaimed this parable and said, From Aram, Balak, king of Moab, led me from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me. Come bring anger upon Israel. How can I curse? God has not cursed. How can I anger? Shem is not angry. For from its origins I see it, rock-like, and from hills do I see it. Behold, it is a nation that will dwell in solitude and not be reckoned among the nations. Who has counted the dust of Jacob, or numbered a quarter of Israel? May my soul die the death of the upright, and my end be like his. Balak said to him, Go now with me to a different place from which you will see them. However, you will see its edge, but not see all of it, and you will curse it for me from there. He took him to the field of the, out, of the lookouts, to the top of the peak, and he built seven altars and brought up a bull and a ram on each altar. So that was a very beautiful utterance, I would say. I think it's, I don't know what I say in the commentary. Again, this is like a, an entry from 2013, so it's quite a while ago, but I know we've discussed this together in class. But it's almost as if God wants to speak to Israel directly through Balak. you got to wonder why they've got Moshe, right? They've got the Torah. But it's just beautiful. He's trying to tell. I'm like, really, he's talking to his people. I'm not angry with you. I haven't cursed you, right? It's interesting the way that he's using the method by which he's trying to get this message across to them, maybe to us too. Hear the words of the Lord, the message to his people, the sounding of his heart for all Israel and those grafted in to hear. The message which is unfathomably reviving and restoring, the communication of the immense love of the Lord, that which he has for his children, which he longs for us to take note of, to hear, and to repeat in continuity. He says to Israel, and the message remains, I have not cursed you, I am not angry with you, I see you from your heights and you are strong. The Hebrew text uses the word shakan, meaning to reside permanently and remain. It is also part of the word meaning tabernacle. Among the nations, the people will not be tabernacling. They will be holy and set apart. They are not regarded or counted by God among the nations. This is a picture we see before us today. Living a Torah life truly means being set apart. Oftentimes, once we adopt and begin to adhere to the eternal Torah of our King and Master Yeshua, we are met 
with staunch opposition. We are accused of many things, be it rejecting Christ, or conforming to the law for the sake of the law, or depriving our children of the rich and lasting rituals based on pagan practices which God despises. Leaving grace behind for obedience to man-made liturgy, etc. What is most disheartening is that these accusations and assumptions are not typically made by secular friends, neighbors, and family members in our lives. They are sounded by those who profess to live, quote-unquote, in the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control of the Spirit. Living a Bible-centered Torah lifestyle means to be truly set apart. You will not fit into any man-made mold. What occurs is the Lord sets out, the, sets out to mold you into a servant who hearkens, is obedient to his will, and one who, with, who, without fear, will take up the charge of the Lord as it appears in Scripture. Treasure from Heaven Torah living does not adapt to modern times or shape our mode of worship, study, or community into something which is bigger, better, or faster, rearrangeable, or more palatable for the sake of evangelism, or growing in numbers. Living a Torah life defined by God with an open heart led by the Spirit means our bodies and our secrets are, are not open for all to see. We are challenged to be set apart and in this journey through the desert. God speaks through his eternal word and will cause you to grow and progress as you walk in faith and obedience because you have discovered what grace really means. The Lord has set the boundaries and limits for us. He has given us his plan and map. He has set before us the door and given us the key. Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua the Messiah alive on every page of the Torah. How's it going? Good. Yeah. Any other sip of that, please? I'm kind of sick. Whoa. Okay. Really? Sorry, okay, I had too much coffee already. That's good. I should put it in the freezer. Mm. And then like, eat it later. And it's all frozen. Mmm. I was going to wait for Kylan, but I think she might have done something else or gotten into doing something else. So I'm going to go ahead and go on for the sake of no dead air if possible. Going on reading in Job chapter 38, verse 2 through 11. Who is this who gives murky counsel with words without knowledge? Gird your loins like a warrior and I will ask you and you will inform me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell if you know understanding, who set its dimensions, if you know, or who stretched a surveyor's line over it, into what are its bases sunken, or who laid its cornerstone. When the morning stars stand in unison, and all the heavenly beings shouted, as he dammed in the sea with bolted doors, as its flow emerged from the womb, when I put a cloud on it, as its garment, and a thick cloud as its swaddling, and I constrained it with my limits, and I emplaced a bar, and bolted its doors, and said, Until here shall you go, and no further, and only here shall you, your waves flaunt their majesty. The curses are stayed before they can even come forth, and emerge as these beautiful blessings which continue to unfold. The next section is the beyond is beyond measure. 
Joker, it shows us the extent of God's willingness to love despite horrific failures on our part. What man would find unimaginable, unforgivable, unconscionable, the Lord has a co- the capability to not only see beyond, but to change into something completely new, renovated and magnificent for the sake of his name. The Lord wants Israel to know that despite all the terrible things they have done through their wanderings in the wilderness, all of the unbelieving, uh, unbelievable betrayals that they have committed against him, he doesn't see them as failures idolaters or heretics he wants them to see themselves how he sees them and this communication from Avinu Malkinu our father and our king is for each and every one of us as well if he is able to bless these people after all that has transpired with the promise that he sees no iniquity or perversity in them and even further that he is their friend how much can we trust that he feels the same for us I long for the friendship of the king to be declared in my life and my household. Oh, nothing could be sweeter. If a member of Kyler, if you've got a comment or a question, you can definitely interrupt. Yeah. We need bar box to Parsha 23, 16 through 27. Hashem happened upon Bil'am and put an utterance in his mouth and said, Go back to Balak and so shall you say, he declaimed this parable and said, Stand erect, O Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should be deceitful, nor a son of man that he should relent. Would he say and not do, or speak and not confirm? Behold, to bless have I received. He has blessed, and I shall not contradict it. He perceived no iniquity in Jacob, and saw no perversity in Israel. Hashem, his God, is with him, and the friendship of the king is in him. It is God who brought them out of Egypt according to the power of his loftiness. For there is no divination in Jacob and no sorcery in Israel. Even now it is said of Jacob and Israel what God has wrought. Behold, the people will arise like a lion cub and raise itself like a lion. It will not lie down until it consumes prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Balak said to Bil'am, Neither shall you curse them at all, nor shall you bless them at all. Bil'am answered and said to Balak, Have I not spoken to you, saying, Whatever Hashem shall speak, that shall I do? Balak said to Bil'am, Go now, I shall take you to a different place. Perhaps it will be proper in God's eyes that you will curse them for me from there. The blessings of Israel, Jacob to his son Judah, from the line from which Messiah Yeshua would come, are amazing when we read them in conjunction with the scripture of Numbers and Matthew. Um, Yaakov, Jacob, speaks of the lion, as does Bil'am, and the donkey with its colt. Donkey sounds familiar to our parsha. Blessed are you, my king, for the wonders of your word. So we're reading Matthew 21, verse 1 through 9. As they were approaching Jerusalem, they came to Beit Pegai on the Mount of Olives. Yeshua sent to Talmudim with these instructions: Go into the village ahead of you, and you will immediately find a donkey. Tethered there with its colt, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell that him the Lord needs them, and he will let them go at once. This happens in order to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, riding humbly on a donkey and on a colt, the offspring of a beast of burden. So the Talmudim did as Yeshua had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their robes on them. Crowds of people carpeted the road with their clothing, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds ahead of him and behind shouted, Please deliver us to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. Genesis 49, 8-12 through 12. Judah, 
You, your brother, shall acknowledge. Your hand will be at your enemy's nape. Your father's sons will prostrate themselves to you. A lion cub is Judah. From the prey, my son, you elevated yourself. He crouches, lies down like a lion, like an awesome lion who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a scholar from among his descendants until Shelah arrives, and his will his will be an assemblage of nations. He will tie his donkey to the vine, and to the vine branch his donkey full. He will launder his garments with wine and his robe in the blood of grapes, red eyed from wine and white tooth from milk. So obviously it's coming from God. You can hear the very similarities. Jacob's blessing. Did Bilam know it by heart, or is this divine inspiration? They're super similar. And all pointing to the king. Are you sure? Oh no, there was Ezekiel 19, 1 through 9. Oh, how your mother was a lioness, crouching among lions, rearing her cubs among young lions. She raised one of her cubs, and he became a young lion. He learned to tear prey and devoured men. So the nations were mustered against him, and he was caught in her pit, and they brought him with hooks to the land of Egypt. She saw herself disillusioned, her hope was lost, so she took another one of her cubs and made him become a young lion. He learned to tear prey, he devoured men. He destroyed their palaces and their cities, he laid waste. The land and all that, it, that fills it then became desolate through the noise of his roar. So all the nations of the surrounding countries set themselves against him. They spread their net over him, and he was caught in their pit. They put a collar on him with hooks and brought him to the king of Babylonia. They brought him into the fortresses in order that his voice be no longer heard upon the mountains of this area. <clears throat> this time, Bil'am looks. This time, he sees that this people truly possesses the favor, favor of the Most High God. Imagine how wondrous a sight it is to witness the order of the encampment of Israel. The ordained order of the Lord, each tribe under his banner, the tabernacle in the center. From a height, it was surely a vast and glorious sight. This time, Bil'am takes notice, and this time it says the Spirit was upon him. This time he issues the prophecies that are repeated in the daily liturgy of the Jewish people to this very day. This time Balaam gets the promise right. Those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse will be cursed. Back into the parasha of Amidbar 24, 1 through 9. Balaam saw that it was good in Hashem's eyes to bless Israel, so he did not go, as every other time, toward divinations, but he set his face toward the wilderness. Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel dwelling according to its tribes, and the Spirit of God was upon him. He declaimed his parable and said, The words of Balaam, son of Beor, the words of the man with the open eye, the words of the one who hears the sayings of God, who sees the visions of Shaddai while fallen and with uncovered eyes. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, stretching out like brooks, like gardens by a river, like aloes planted by Hashem, like cedars by water. Water shall flow from his wells, and his seed shall be abundant. Waters. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Smart girl. Smart girl. I'm battling the flies out here. <laughs> um, his seed shall be like abundant waters. His king shall be exalted over Agag, and his kingdom shall be upraised. It is God who brought him out of Egypt according to the power of his loftiness. He will consume the nations that oppress him and crush their bones, and his arrow shall pierce them. He crouched and lay down like a lion, 
like a lion cub, who can stand him up? Those who bless you are blessed, and those who curse you are accursed. And Hosea 14, 5 through 9. I will rectify their waywardness. I will love them gratuitously, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be to Israel like the dew, and he will blossom like a rose bush, and his roots will strike out like the cedars of Lebanon. His tender branches will go forth, and his glory will be like that of the olive tree, and his fragrance like that of Lebanon. Those who dwell in his shade will return, they will revive like grain and blossom like a vine. Their repute will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim will say, What more need have I of idols? I will respond and I will gaze upon him. I am like an ever fresh cypress tree. Your fruit will be provided for me. The next portion of the curses which emerge as blessings are known in most circles to be prophetic and speak of Messiah. Bil Am speaks of the conquering king who comes with the sword and will restore all things. Matthew 10, 34 reads, Do not suppose I have come to bring peace to the land. It is not peace I have come to bring, but a sword. But first, Micah 5, Micah 5, 1 through 3. Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrat, Ephrata, you are too small to be among the thousands of Judah, but from you someone will emerge for me to be a ruler over Israel. And his origins shall be from early times, as from days of old. Therefore he will deliver them until the time that a woman in childbirth give birth, gives birth. Then the rest of his brothers will return with the children of Israel. He will stand up and lead with the strength of Hashem, with the majesty of the name of Hashem his God. They will settle in peace. For at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. And this will assure peace. So again, this next section of the parasha, the Midbar, Numbers 24, 10, going all the way through 25. Balak's anger flared against Bil'am, and he clapped his hands. Balak said to Bil'am, to curse my enemies, did I summon you? And behold, you continually bless them these three times. Now, flee to your place. I said I would honor you, but behold, Hashem is with held you from honor. Bilam said to Balak, Did I not speak to your emissaries whom you sent to me, saying, If Balak were to give me his house, full, his house full of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of Hashem to do good or bad on my own. Whatever Hashem speaks, that shall I speak. And now behold, I go to my people. Come, I shall advise you to what this people will do to your people in the end of days. He declaimed this parable and said, The words of Bil Am, son of Beor, the words of the man with the open eye, the words of the one who hears the sayings of God and knows the knowledge of the Supreme One, who sees the vision of Shaddai while fallen and with uncovered eyes. I shall see him, but not now. I shall look at him, but it is not near. A star has issued from Jacob, and a scepter bearer has arisen from Israel. And he shall pierce the nobles of Moab, and undermine the children of Seth. Edom shall be a conquest, and Seir shall be the conquest of his enemies, and Israel will attain success. One from Jacob shall rule and destroy the remnant of the city. He, Bilam, saw Amalek and declaimed, his parable and said, Amalek is the first among nations, but its end will be eternal destruction. He, Bil'am, saw the Kenite and declaimed his parable and said, Strong is your dwelling and set in a rock is your nest. For if the Kenite should be laid waste, to where can Assyria take you captive? He declaimed his parable and said, Oh, who will survive when he imposes these? Big ships from the coast of Kittim will afflict Assyria and afflict the other bank, but it too will be forever destroyed. Then Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went on his way. There is 
a profound meaning in the Lord's usage of the evil prophet Bill Am in delivering this message of eternal promise and love for his people, children of Israel. His promise remains and is reaffirmed when Yeshua came for his brethren and the wild branches grafted into the tree of Israel. Not only is it incredible to recognize that the Lord creates the very best of things from even the path we stray down and even despite our failures and fallings along the way. God takes evil and sin and death and turns it upside down to establish new life, righteousness, redemption, and hope. Consider this. From the horrors of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, the nation of Israel and the Promised Land was reborn. Out of the inquisitions and centuries of persecution and forced conversions of the Jewish people, they have preserved the Torah and writings in the original language, Hebrew and Aramaic, to this day. Ruth was the granddaughter of Eglon, king of Moab, who himself was a grandson of Balak, king of Moab, one who set out to curse Israel. The descendants of Ruth are Jesse, David, and Yeshua. God is a master planner, and his ways are mighty and magnificent. He has a plan for all of us, and if we would just trust him, he has lovingly prepared and given us the way to get there. And in every bit of it is meant to glorify and magnify Yeshua, the light to his righteous path for us. John 14, 1-4 reads, Do not let yourselves be disturbed. Trust in God and trust in me. In my Father's house there are many places to live. If there weren't, I would have told you, because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And since I am going and preparing a place for you, I will return to take you with me, so that where I am you may be also. Furthermore, you know the way where I am going. You know where I am going, and you know the way. Proverbs 6, 21-24 Tie them to your heart always, and twine them upon your neck. As you go forth, they will guide you. As you recline, it will guard you, and when you awake, it will converse with you. For a commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is light, and reproving discipline is a way of life, to guard you from an evil woman, from the smoothness of a foreign woman's tongue. I was waiting and I'm here and I'll talk to Is he still in there? I think so. Okay. Mm, let's see how much more. If I need to, I'll do that now. There's not too much more. I'll deal with it when we finish up here. Alright. The end of the Cedra of Balak brings us to the terrible account of the Midianite women and men of Israel. As we read the scripture below, keep in mind the elements of making covenant in the ancient world. There is a verbal declaration, blood or an offering, and it is sealed with wine and a meal. In Devarim, Deuteronomy 32:15, Yes, Sharun became fat and kicked. You became fat and you became thick and you became corpulent and it deserted its maker, its God, and was contemptuous of the rock of its salvation. They would provoke his jealousy with strangers. They would anger him with abominations. Jeremiah 5, 26-28 For wicked men are found among my people who lie in ambush like a trap that snaps shut. They set a snare. They trap people. Like a cage full of fowl, so their houses are full of deceit. Thereby they have grown great and wealthy. They have grown fat and corpulent and also transgressed through wicked deeds. So the Midbar numbers 25, 1 through 5. Israel settled in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. They invited the people to the feast of their gods. The people ate and prostrated themselves to their gods. Israel became attached to the Baal Peor, and the wrath of Hashem flared against Israel. Hashem said to Moshe, Take all the leaders of the people. Hang them before Hashem against the sun, and the flaring wrath of Hashem will withdraw from Israel. Moshe said to the judges of Israel, 
Let each man kill his men who are attached to the Baal Peor. Balak and Balaam look out over the assembly of Israel and they know of the battles the Lord has fought for them and realize these people cannot be conquered by warring with them. They seek out methods of divination and curse and attempt to cause the people to be overcome by words that will cause them to be seen as a people who are damned. The Lord continually reveals that his word regarding Israel shall stand and none shall thwart it. The only way that Israel is manageable and manipulated is when they are in the throes of sin. Sinning against their God will be their undoing and this is the only way to cause them to stumble. Bil'am knows their weakness, and through his recommendation, the princesses and high society women of Midian are sent into the camp to lure, tempt, and to overcome the men of Israel. The men in the throes of passion are convinced to bow and offer worship to the idols of the temptresses, and they eat of the meal of the dead, those who defile the name of God and devour the purity of the people. In Bar 31, 15, Moshe said to them, Did you let every female live? Behold, it was they who caused the children of Israel, by the word of Bil'am, to commit a betrayal against Hashem. Regarding the matter of Peor and the plague occurred in the assembly of Hashem. In Psalm 106, 28, Then they attached themselves to Baal Peor and ate sacrifices of the dead. And they angered him with their behavior, and a plague broke out among them. And Phineas arose and executed judgment, and the plague was halted. It was accounted to him as a righteous deed for all generations forever. There was but one man who stood up for the sanctity of God, while the rest of the people mourned and wailed. Even before the face of Moshe was this act of defiance taking place. Phineas, or Pinchas, stood with zeal and spear, and the plague was halted. The next Torah portion goes in depth about the meaning of the actions of the people and of Phineas, the one with whom God seals an eternal covenant of peace. In Bamid Bar, Numbers 25, 6 through 9, Behold, a man of the children of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman near to his brothers, in the sight of Moshe, and in the sight of the entire assembly of the children of Israel, and they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Phineas, son of Elazar, son of Aaron, the Kohen, saw, and he stood up from amid the assembly and took a spear in his hand. He followed the Israelite man into the tent and pierced them both, the Israelite man and the woman, into her stomach. And the plague was halted from among the children of Israel. Those who died in the plague were 24,000. In Micah 6, 3 through 5, My people... What did I do to you, and how did I tire you? Testify against me. For I brought, up, brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam before you. My people hear now what Balak, king of Moab, schemed, and what Bil'am, son of Beor, answered him. And all the events, from Shittim to Gilgal, in order to recognize the righteous acts of Hashem. Why does this portion of blessing end with more transgression and plague? I believe it's to show us that we all have a very long way to go. The work of Hashem has begun in us and it will not come to an end until we are able to serve Him eternally in His house. We are continually to walk in faith and actively work to uncover a relationship with our King. We are to... We are in turn charged to remember that among the blessings and promise comes responsibility, and we are charged to behave as those who bear his name. It is for his name's sake we will be shown mercy, and for that reason alone, that we are his and he has claimed us. Before we rest in the promise and grace idly, let us remember that we serve a merciful Father and righteous Judge. Each one of us will stand before the judge, and he will not forsake even one of his children, nor will he fail to respond in just reason. The time in which we find ourselves now is the period of the three weeks or dire straits. So this was in 2013, but actually this year in 2021. 
Um, a Sunday tomorrow will begin the fast of the 17th of Tammuz. So that was just, we'll be just beginning our whole season of Teshuva, of repentance, and just really pointing our face. Maybe it's perfect as Bilam's face was pointed, to, pointed toward Israel that we should point our face toward these high holy days that are a matter of weeks away. Um, for the Jewish people throughout history, this period has been a period of remembering. Without Hashem forefront, there is no wiggle room, no chance, chances for ignorance of the vivid messages He has sent us, no place to turn to the right or to the left from the lasting and enduring communication. He continues to divulge to us. Let us cling to him and in, entreat with our hearts for forgiveness and mercy upon us for the sins and curses of this and past generations. May they emerge as an eternal message of blessing over Israel and all God's people. Through all things, may his righteousness be seen. Micah 7, 8. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, for though I fell, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, Hashem is light unto me. I shall bear the fury of Hashem, for I have sinned unto him. He will take up my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me out into the light. I will behold his righteousness. In Psalm 9, from 8. For Hashem is enthroned forever. He prepares his throne for judgment. And he will judge the world in righteousness. He will judge the regime, regimes with fairness. Hashem will be a fortress for the oppressed, a fortress in times of distress. And those who know your name will trust in you, for you have not forsaken those who seek you, Hashem. Sing to Hashem who dwells in Zion. Proclaim his deeds among the peoples, that the avenger of blood has remembered them. He has not forgotten the cry of the humble. Have mercy on me, O Hashem. See my affliction by my foes. You who raises me above the gates of death, so that I may proclaim all your praises. In the gates of the daughter of Zion, I will rejoice in your salvation. The nations sank in their self-made pit. In the very trap concealed, their own foot was ensnared. Hashem became known through the judgment that he executed. Through his own handiwork was the wicked person entrapped. Reflect on this, Selah. The wicked will return to the depths of the grave, all the nations that forget God. For the pauper shall not be forgiven, forgotten eternally, nor the hope of the afflicted forever perish. Arise, Hashem, let not frail man feel invincible. Let the peoples be judged before you. Hashem, place your mastery over them that the peoples may know that they are but frail men. So that. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech kala Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God, gracious giver of your Torah. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. My King, it is for you I hunger. It is for you I long. Tear me open and carve for me all that is not of you and cause it to be lost forever. Light the way for all your people. Strengthen and encourage us to walk the way you have planned and prepared. May none of your children stumble on their way to finding you and coming closer to you. Keep our ways firmly planted in your eternal truth and your Yeshua. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive our fathers. And please allow for our children to go forth after we have returned to you with zeal for your justice and righteousness we have lacked. Protect and strengthen your people as we weep along with them and pray alongside them. Bless them and restore them to the place you have prepared for them as your treasure. May we be a part of the eternal blessings and service and devotion to you. It is in Yeshua's name I ask these things, and I ask that only honor and glory come through all of this, and that it be for a blessing. And that's the end. So 17th of Tammuz. There's some notes here just for tomorrow. And then anybody's fasting. The fast of the 17th of the Hebrew month of Tammuz. Known as Ash 
Shiva Asar Batamuz. It start it is the start of the three week mourning period for the destruction of Jerusalem and the two holy temples. The fast actually commemorates five tragic events that occurred on this date. Moshe broke the tablets when he saw the Jewish people worshipping the golden calf. During the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem, the Jews were forced to cease offering the daily sacrifices due to the lack of sheep. Apostomos burned the Holy Torah. An idol was placed in the Holy Temple. The walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Romans in 69 CE after a, after a lengthy siege. Three weeks later, after the Jews put up a valiant struggle, the Romans destroyed the Second Holy Temple on the 9th of Av. The Jerusalem Talmud maintains that this is also the date when the Babylonians breached the walls of Jerusalem on their way to destroying the First Temple. This commences the period of the three weeks, also known as the Dire Straits, that pass from tomorrow through the 9th of Av. Why pay attention to these dates leading to the 9th of Av? Well, let's look at what happened on that day in history. Twelve spies sent by Moshe to observe the land of Canaan returned from their mission. Only two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, brought a positive report, while the others spoke disparagingly about the land. The majority report caused the children of Israel to cry, panic, and despair of ever entering the promised land. For this, they were punished by God, that their generation would not enter the land. Because of the Israelites' lack of faith, God decreed that for all generations, the state would become one of crying and misfortune for the descendants. You can read that account in Numbers chapter 13 through 14. Also on the 9th of Av, the first temple built by King Solomon in the kingdom of Judah, the king of Judah was destroyed by the Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BCE. After the siege in 587, the Judeans were sent into the Babylonian exile. The second temple, built by Ezra and Nehemiah, was destroyed by the Romans in August of 70 CE. Scattering the people of Judea and commencing the Jewish exile from the Holy Land, according to the Talmud and Tractate Tanait, the destruction of the Second Temple began on the 9th of Av. The Temple continued to burn through the 10th of Av. The Romans crushed Bar Kokhba's revolt and destroyed the city of Betar, killing over 100,000 Jews on July 8th of 132 CE, or the 9th of Av. Following the Bar Kokhba revolt, Roman commander Turnus Rufus plowed the site of the temple and the surrounding area. The First Crusade officially commenced on August 15th or the 9th of Av in 1096. 10,000 Jews in the first month were killed. Jewish communities were destroyed in France and in the Rhineland. A grand total of 1.2 million Jews were killed by this crusade that started on the 9th of Av. The Jews were expelled from England on July 25th, 1290, the 9th of Av. The Jews were expelled from France on July 21st, 1306, again, the 9th of Av. The Jews were expelled from Spain on July 31st, 1492, Av 8 through 9. On August 2nd, 1941, the 9th of Av, SS Commander Heinrich Himmler formally received approval from the Nazi party for the final solution. Almost 50% of the Jews on the face of the earth were captured and killed at that time. On the 9th of Av in 5702, corresponding to July 23rd, 1942, the mass deportation began of Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto en route to Treblinka. Most religious communities used Tisha B'Av to mourn the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. We, with our limited understanding, our limited human minds can never truly understand events in our own lives. An illness, an injury, a robbery, a fire, all of these things seem cruel. They seem unfair and even unjust. However, often, in retrospect, years later, we will see that because of this, we met 
because of this, we met this one, and this happened, and if it hadn't happened then, who knows what might have happened. So, so many things that happened were painful at the time of their occurrence, but later on, we see that the chain of events was for the good, and Hashem had his reasons for doing it in precisely this way. And that was a quote from Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. So, Shabbat Shalom. Have an easy fast and a blessed, meaningful fast tomorrow. When is your fast? It's tomorrow from sun daybreak, dawn. You can get up and eat before then, and it ends at 